everybody. This is Josh McKinney. Just want to welcome you to episode 107 of the I Suck at Jiu-Jitsu show. And uh, thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, this episode was requested a lot. This is probably our most requested episode because I, uh, on an episode of like 10 episodes ago, I did a thing talking about how to make money doing jujitsu without running a jujitsu school. And I, if I'm being honest, did a great job on that episode. And so a lot of people were excited about it. And it begged to the question, how do you make money doing jujitsu while running a jujitsu school? And so uh, I really don't focus a ton on the day-to-day -day operations of a school of uh, from this episode or on this episode. What I do focus on is uh, how to start your jujitsu school. And I think that is one of the most important things because you should have a lot of questions already answered when you are starting your jujitsu school. And I think this makes it a lot easier. And so all I do is ask uh, like six or seven different questions on this and, and explain my thought behind it, what my answer was uh, when I asked myself those questions. And you can do the same. Uh, so uh, this episode is, is really, really a fun one if you want to start a jiu-jitsu school but even if you don't even if you're somebody who just is a little more interested into how a jiu-jitsu school it runs what is important about it and uh, it might even give you some notes on if the school that you're at is a good school or a not so good school and uh, i think that i don't know i think that there's just a lot that comes with this episode that uh you know, has a lot of rabbit holes. And uh, before we get into it, before we get into this episode, uh, I just wanted to tell you guys about some really cool organic marketing, which is what we talk about on the show uh, in just probably like 20 minutes. Uh, we'll get into what organic marketing is, um, but a, a cool success of my organic marketing actually comes from you guys. And it comes from this podcast. I like to mention often about my free ebook simplifying jujitsu at simplifyingjujitsu.com uh, what that is is an ebook where we break down the five essential positions of brazilian jujitsu and we talk about how to train them and something that's cool is without me putting any money into ads or any money into anything i have a lot of people that sign up week to week for this free ebook, just because I mentioned it on the podcast. And then guess what happens? They kind of join the suck less team a lot, uh, a lot more than it, most people would realize because I get to email them. I get to talk to them about what's going on with the gym and what's going on uh, with competing and what's going on with just everything. And so uh, if you guys are looking to kind of grow your jujitsu knowledge, go to simplifyingjujitsu.com. And today, the day before Thanksgiving, I know we did a Wednesday episode release, which is just obnoxious. Uh, from today, tomorrow, which is Thanksgiving. If you guys are not in America, you got to get in on this Thanksgiving stuff. It's the best. And then on Black Friday, the whole entire day, uh, we are having 40% off the entire store at simplifyingjujitsu.com. I've really been recommending this be the time for people to get my instructional uh, mastering the duck guard. Uh, this is a cross sleeve guard that I invented that is super unique and uh, hopefully you guys will get to see me use it some at the worlds in a few weeks. Uh, but uh, it, it's a really, really fun instructional. And I think it's filmed differently than maybe any instructional you've ever seen the way that we uh, break down and, and look at the moves. And so, uh, and also at the end of the year, there is going to be some revision on that. So you will be able to, you could purchase it now for 40% off. And then after we add those new details and those new videos to it, you will continue to have the original product plus all of the new videos and all of the new details uh, that we're adding and you can get that for 40 percent off with promo code black friday and uh, again that ends at, on saturday morning of this week so you guys can check it out without further ado let's jump into the episode so you want to start a bjj school i'm not going to tell you whether or not you should or shouldn't. I'm not going to say, oh, wait till this belt to do it. Uh, I think that's kind of a personal thing. You know, I started my 
jujitsu school when I was pretty deep, almost at the end of my purple belt. And I, you could make some arguments that I started it a little too early for my competition career. And you could make other arguments and say that I, I started probably at the perfect time uh, for my business career. And so uh, it is going to be different from person to person, whether or not you should be starting a jujitsu school. And so we're not going to focus, like I said, we're not going to focus a lot on should you or should you not. Uh, we're going to go ahead and assume that you made the decision that you were going to start a jujitsu school. You, uh, it's something you've always wanted. And <clears throat> as we go through the questions about what you will need to do before you actually open your doors, uh, maybe it will deter you. Maybe if you haven't thought through certain of the, some of these things, you will go, oh, that's a lot harder than I thought. Uh, so uh, and we're also going to talk about some really simple ways at the end to, I guess, to not have to start a jujitsu school from scratch. Uh, uh, just some, some little thoughts on how you can kind of get your feet wet teaching more. Uh, Cause like I said, we're not going to spend a lot of time on teaching. Mostly we're just going to look at the business aspect of running a jujitsu school. So the first question, and I have a lot of questions uh, that you should answer and you can even write these down and have a detailed answer for them. Uh, when I do my business coaching, that's most of what it is, is me asking people questions and then they, they answer them. They answer them in their own words and then we talk about that answer. Uh, and I think that's one of the best ways to learn a lot of times, especially when it comes to business, because we always have these different ideas and thoughts. Sometimes they're true, sometimes they are not. But it's nice to have somebody asking you these questions to make you think about what you need to think about. The first thing you need to think about when you are starting your own jujitsu school is where do you want to start it? Where do you want to go? Uh, you know, and this has a few uh, a few layers to it because sometimes you go, you you train at a place, and the coach you know would not be happy about you having a school fifteen minutes away or twenty minutes away, right? Uh, you know, you have to have a certain amount of space between the two. Most of the time, it, just in my opinion, I think that's pretty silly. You know, if you have a city with hundreds of thousands of people, if it isn't big enough to support two jujitsu schools, uh, you guys probably both suck at marketing. And so you've got to be smart about uh, it, how you go about it, where you're going to go. Uh, and I think something to answer too is why do you want to go in that area? Is it because you feel that there is more money in that area? That's honestly a lot of factor that goes into starting jujitsu school is a lot of people I talk to, they say, I want to go here because I know there's money. And you know, jujitsu can, you can charge a lot of money for teaching jujitsu. If I have um, a, a gym with 50 students, it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but if I have a gym with 50 students and they're paying $250 a month, well, that sounds a lot better, right? Versus if they were all paying $99 a month or something like that. Right. So I'm able to, uh, I'm able to make more if I go to a place that allows that allows me to make more. Uh, here's the problem with that. If I go to a place that is more expensive, that has more money. I'm going to have higher overhead. So when I'm going, deciding where I want to go, it's important that I think about the financial situation. I don't want to go into some place that's going to cost me $8,000 a month to rent. At $100 a student, you need 80 students just to start making money, actually just to pay your rent, honestly, because there's going to be other expenses. There are going to be other things that come up. So uh, something I'm big on is starting with low overhead. Uh, I, don't, I don't say you have to do that. Some people don't do that. And uh, they, they grow and they have a good, successful jiu-jitsu school. But honestly, the start, the beginning of your school is the most important time because you are deciding whether or not you are going to make money doing this. Anybody can have a jujitsu school, but not everybody can make money owning a jujitsu school. Uh, they're, they're different things, right? Uh, so when we're looking at that, we want something low overhead. You know, when I went to my first school, I uh, started my first school. Technically, we actually started in my garage. It was unofficial. No one was paying. It was just a place to train. Uh, and then we took about six guys, seven guys over 
uh, to our first official school. Our first official school was an apartment uh, that we remodeled to just be an empty space. And uh, in the, the whole facility was 1,400 square feet, 1,450, which if you don't know, that's not very big. A lot of a lot of decent sized gyms, like my gym now has that much mat space in its main room. It's got about 1,500 in its main room. So that's not a lot of space. And in those 1,450, four, those 1,450 square feet, we had a bathroom, we had a personal training studio, and we had a gym. So our mat space was down to 750 square feet. And in that is actually a little less than that. And in that space, I was able to grow the gym to like 120 students and uh, like reoccurring payment, real students. That is uh, that that kind of shows that you don't need a ton of space to start your jujitsu school. Uh, Like I said, if you were to measure the mat space at your gym, I would be shocked if, uh, you know, there, there are many people that have less than 700 square feet that have more than a hundred students, but that about 700, 800 square feet, you can get about a hundred students um, between kids and adults and be very safe with your training. Still uh, it's when you start to get over that, that it starts to get really tight. That was the problem we ran into. That's why we moved. But uh, this is just the, the first thought is where do you want to go? Why do you want to go there? Uh, is it financially? Is it that you just love the area? Is it that you plan on moving to the area because, uh, you know, after your school starts to become successful, uh, you, you can kind of do that. You know, not all jujitsu businesses are made for the same reason of I want this to be the sole thing that I provide for my family with. You could run a jujitsu school and say, hey, you know, my job is great. I'm a whatever. I'm a firefighter. So I have a cool schedule or, you know, I am anything that doesn't work the main nights that you would be teaching jujitsu. And, uh, you could say, I'm just doing this to, because I want to move into this cool city that I'm moving my gym. And the first goal that I have is just to pay a mortgage of my new house It's to pay my monthly payment on my house. And, uh, it sets you a small goal. But if that's what you're looking for, that is what you're looking for. Maybe your jujitsu school is like, hey, I want to make a ton of money teaching jujitsu. If that is your thought, I would say probably do something else. Uh, Not that you can't make a ton of money doing jujitsu. I just think that there are a lot of other easier or simpler avenues. I don't want to say easy, uh, but a lot of simpler avenues to make money uh, running your own business than other than doing jujitsu. So that brings me to the next point. Understand it is a business. You do not want to have a school that makes no money. You especially do not want to have a school that you lose money on. Okay. That makes it a bad business. If you are going in and losing money, it makes it a bad business. You may have a plan. You may ha- know that you're going to have to eat losses for the first few months to, uh, to, to be able to, to do well. And you know, it's uh, interesting for me because I focused on low overhead first. I actually never at, uh, at either of the gyms that I own uh, have ever lost money in a month. Uh, we have always we've always been positive. Maybe that positive was a dollar, but we've always been positive, and uh, that's really important when you're running a business because if you lose money month to month, maybe you're losing money every other month or something. Eventually you are going to lose your business unless you just have an unlimited resource to just keep pouring in. But if that was the case, you probably wouldn't be starting your own business. So when we uh, look at a jujitsu school, a lot of times we look at it for what it is, this cool uh, place that I'm going to get to teach jujitsu and I'm going to have a team and and it's going to be awesome. But there is, uh, there is a lot of, I wouldn't say negative. There are a lot of cons probably a negative, I guess you could say, but uh, there are a lot of things you don't expect when running a school. So if you go into it as this is going to be a cool, fun hangout uh, for me and all my buddies, a lot of times you have to make a 
really, really tough shift later on where you say, well, I need to either close my doors or I need to focus on this as a business. Uh, I see it happen a lot to people. They think of it as, um, you know, maybe their their coach did a great job creating an awesome environment and they think about it like, oh, this just happened organically. This happens everywhere. And so they go start their own school and it's just way tougher than they expect. And so uh, when we're going into our jujitsu school, we need to understand that it is a business. And since it is a business, our customers are very, very important. So that brings me to the next question. Who do you want to attract? Who do you want to have as your customer? Because this is pretty much one of the most important things. I mean, this is pretty much what we're going to talk about the rest of the podcast is customers. Uh, we're going to talk about startup costs and stuff like that in a little bit. But the main thought is who are you going to attract and how are you going to attract them? So let's focus on who first. Uh, a lot of times when we're moving into a certain area, we have somebody in mind that we're going to attract. We're moving into a really nice area. We're thinking, man, I want to get all these lawyers and their kids training, or I want to get uh, people that just have uh, really good professions that make a lot of money because I want to charge top dollar for my jujitsu school. Do you want to work more with adults? Do you want to work more with kids? Now, this is something that is important to note. A lot of people think that in order to have a successful jujitsu school, that you have to have kids classes. That is not true. Uh, my coach has one of the most successful jujitsu schools that I know of. And he, I mean, he had a kid's program for like the first two months of having his gym, three months of having his gym, maybe. And I think it had two kids in it. And then he's like, Hey, I'm not going to do this anymore. And the rest is history. He has a super successful jujitsu gym. You do not have to have kids. Kids do make it easier to start because kids are more likely to sign up. When a kid walks through the door, it's pretty common that their parents sees how good it can be for them and they sign them up. Now, here is the problem with focusing on the kids program. The turnover rate of kids is astronomically higher than it is for adults. Uh, and it's not because of, you know, obviously it can be because, you know, you're a bad kids coach or something like that, but usually that's not the reason. Usually it is because Kids do a lot of other things. Kids play sports. Kids play outside when the weather's nice. Kids want to do other things. Or sometimes their parents are just lazy, good for nothings, and don't feel like bringing them to jujitsu. So eventually they cancel. Uh, it, it's really common for that to happen. You can find certain adult students that are like your student forever. And so maybe I bring in five kids for every one, uh, uh, one adult with like the same amount of marketing power. The problem is if those five kids only last two months and that adult lasts 10 years, well, that adult is a lot more important. It's a lot more relevant, right? Uh, so we want to make sure that we know who we want to attract. Uh, a, a little last little note on um, the kids is I would say if you don't consider yourself a great teacher, uh, if you don't consider yourself a, a great technician of jujitsu, kids are a great place to start because, I mean, you're not going to run into a kid who has 10 years wrestling experience and is going to beat you up in your, you know, in class in front of everybody. Right. And that can happen in the adult program. Uh, so you just like with kids, you're able to uh, you're able to make the curriculum not so crazy sport or crazy, uh, comp, you know, crazy self-defense. You can kind of, you know, mix and match and, and just teach jujitsu. So, so you do definitely get a difference in the curriculum that you can teach with kids. Uh, and, uh, it just really depends on who you are though. So when you're looking at who you want to attract, I think you want to kind of either attract people that are like you or that you feel like you get along with. Uh, I don't want to, for example, if you come into my gym, it is not a, a top dollar. Uh, it's only doctors and lawyers training here, gym. Uh, it's in a city that is, a, it's like a steel town. It's a town that has a lot more gritty people to it. And 
that's what I wanted though. Right. Uh, because that's where I grew up. That's the type of person that I am. And, uh, I, I wanted to be able to attract people that were like me, that were, uh, young kids whose lives were, were probably substantially better because they have jujitsu in it. And, uh, so that's, you know, when I looked at starting my school, that's what I wanted to attract. Now the question, and this is the million dollar question. This is the most important thing in your gym. How are you going to attract these people? We need somebody in mind that we want to attract, right? Not everyone can be our customer. If I have death metal playing at my gym because we're all here to train hard and try to kill each other, and uh, a mom walks in with her son, she's probably less likely to sign him up, right? Uh, I want to make sure that I know who I'm trying to attract, and I want to make my gym feel friendly to those people, right? Uh, And so, uh, but also... I want a way to attract these people. I want a way to get my message out, get my word out to them. Uh, If you guys go back, maybe, maybe it's like eight or nine episodes ago. uh, It is how to make money doing jujitsu without a jujitsu school. And I honestly think that that episode goes perfectly hand in hand with this episode. This is actually why I'm filming this episode or recording this episode is uh, I had a lot of response that said, Hey, I would love to know how to start a jujitsu school. So now that we're looking at how we want to attract people, and I'm going to give you guys, uh, this will be more of the the teaching part of this episode. A lot of it's just been questions that you decide. Um, But when it comes to marketing, it is something that's very hard for a lot of people to comprehend. When I am marketing, I am trying to get people into the door, at least with a jujitsu school. Uh, That is the only way to truly sell somebody on jujitsu unless they listen to a podcast from somebody they trust and they're just gung ho and they're committed and they're going to sign up. Those people are so few and far in between. Most people come into your gym with reservations. They say, I don't know what this is. I don't know why I'm even here. Why am I getting ready to wrestle with all these people and hug on them while I'm wearing a bathrobe, right? Uh, A lot of people are going to have those problems. So We want to make our environment great to attract that person. Then we want to take a step back and figure out how we can actually get them in the front door. So a lot of people like free trials. Free trials are really good. We actually just stopped doing those at my school because uh, they were working so well. We're getting so many free trials. The problem is uh, it was taking so much energy to deal with so many different people that were really just there for a free trial. They weren't there to commit, right? So when we are going into our jujitsu classes, when we're going into our jujitsu program, uh, we want to have a strong, repetitive way to be bringing in new people because you are always losing people. Uh, No matter how committed you feel like everybody is at your gym, somebody's going to be going through a divorce. Somebody's going to be uh, losing their job. Somebody's just going to get uh, burnt out on jujitsu. You are going to be losing people. So you need to be adding people. And generally, the goal is to be adding more people than we are losing. So uh, our main ways to attract somebody would be through organic marketing or paid marketing. Okay. So we'll look at paid marketing first because it's, I think, the simplest to understand in a sense of me telling you to learn paid marketing. But when you start to see how much it costs, It deters a lot of people and they never do it. So paid marketing, if you are doing it, if you're doing it on your own and you have the right stuff, then you will be, uh, then you'll be in really good shape. Meaning like you have the right, uh, maybe team, uh, you know, like I've, we've hired a lot of people to do marketing for us. And that's where I've learned a lot of the marketing from, uh, and paid really, really top dollar to have these people do marketing for us. Uh, but, and when I say like top dollar, at least for, in, in my opinion, I feel like it's a lot when you're running a small jujitsu school, but you will easily to find a good marketer need to pay at least about like three grand a month to, uh, uh, to really be bringing in people. But let's say you're spending three grand a month and you're bringing in, you're signing up five new students, uh, each month. 
I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but let's say you're charging, let's just go hundred dollars. I know that's cheaper than pretty much anyone would charge anymore for jujitsu, unless you're in a very small place uh, or you just like to charge less than that. Um, but let's say that we're charging hundred dollars. If I have something that costs $3,000 a month and I'm bringing in five new students at a hundred new hundred dollars. So I'm making 500 reoccurring each month and then adding on to that. So that means after six months, I have now paid for my marketing and I can continue to do my marketing and continue to just grow above and be of, uh, above and above what I was already paying. And the cool thing about marketing is uh, pretty much even all the best paid ads. Uh, if you, you know, back in the 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 90s and the early 2000s, if your marketing was about billboards and was about newspapers, what you would want though is for people to try to get more information. Well, now in 2021, if somebody wants more information, where do they go? They decide to go to your website. I want to know more about Head Not HQ, which is my gym. I'm going to go to headnighthq.com. And so I look at headnighthq.com and I go, oh wow, this is a nice site. They have so much cool stuff. And that becomes my organic marketing. So a lot of times we uh, we like do paid advertising to get the word out so people know of us and they start to get more information from our other avenues. They go to our Facebook page. And if I'm really active on my Facebook page and I'm posting really good stuff and a lot of great information about the gym and a lot of my message, well, what's going to happen is people are going to look at it and say, huh, you know, I like this place. I want to I want to go try. I want to go get in the door. And uh, you also need a way to get people in the door. Uh, For example, you need some type of trial and you want it to be as easy as possible. If you guys go to headnighthq.com, you will find that there is not a page that you couldn't sign up for a trial. There is nowhere you can go on our website that there's not easy to just press a button and sign up for a trial because it's so much easier for people to, okay, I'll just put in my name and then we'll see what happens. And then they get contacted and then they're in the gym, they're training. So that is, uh, that is going to be a lot of what marketing is, is just telling a story over and over. And I'm going to give you guys uh, some more specific stuff on what we're trying to do in our gyms now, because there was a time where I was only paid advertising and I was only paid marketing and it was working really well. And we use Facebook for everything. What happens in pretty much all of these, uh, these marketing platforms is as they grow and they grow and they grow, more and more people put money into it and more and more people try to advertise into it. And so uh, you really have to stay up to date on whatever you're going to be advertising on. And honestly, through COVID, I kind of fell behind on uh, understanding Facebook ads as well as I should. And then when I started to start them up again, uh, I felt, uh, you know, I started noticing, man, I'm spending more than I'm making on these and it's not really producing enough of consistent consistent people coming in. And so we decided to change up our advertising for uh, my main school. We decided that we were going to go all organic for a while and see how that goes. Uh, Meaning just Instagram, just Facebook, just what we can post for free and uh, see how that goes. And once your gym gets to a certain size, word of mouth actually starts to become a good way to advertise. At first, word of mouth is not a good way to advertise. Uh, Just hoping that the five students that I have in the gym are going to tell their friends about it and their friends are going to be committed enough to come and sign up. It it just doesn't work that way. When you get to about 100 students, that's when some, some places can just like turn off all ads and only have organic advertising as long as they have a good trial set up and a good way to sign these people up after the trial. So um, this is still, well, I'll go look at one more thing on how do we want to attract people, okay? So just kind of explained a little bit of organic marketing and a little bit of, uh, of paid marketing, but I think something when we're looking at attracting people that a lot of times we don't think about is curriculum. For example, if I'm trying to attract um, middle-aged moms training jujitsu at my gym and my Jiu-Jitsu gym is what it is, uh, which is very, very tough training and uh, uh, just a lot of people that are trying to compete. I understand. And that doesn't mean that middle-aged moms aren't going to join into them. They do. 
they're always crazy, which is awesome because they fit everybody else in the gym. Uh, but what happens is, uh, you know, most of them will not come in, right? Because it, my curriculum just doesn't fit what someone who is um, 45 and looking for, you know, like, hey, I'm just looking for a good workout or I'm looking for just a, a little bit of defending myself. And then I go, okay, cool. We have competitive jujitsu class where we're going to learn about spider guard and Toriando passing today. You know, enjoy your self-defense class. It's not like that, right? I have to have a curriculum that's set up for the people that I'm trying to attract. If I want to have a huge adult program and maybe I do want to have kids, but I don't want to have a huge kids program. Well, I have two kids classes a week and I have five or six or seven adult classes a week. Uh, you know, I build my curriculum around who I'm trying to attract. And I think that's really important for people uh, to understand. Now, the next question, I have two, actually I have a few sub questions in this, um, but I, we, I really have two, two main questions. And uh, the first one is what is this gonna cost? Cost is really important when it comes into starting a business, right? Our overhead, what we are paying month to month to run this business is so important. It is so much more important than people think about. People want to think about the cool parts of running a jujitsu school. I'm going to have beautiful mats. I'm going to have, everything's going to be, everything's going to be a certain color and it's going to look really, really rustic, or it's going to look really, really modern and people are going to love it. We're going to have art on the wall. And that's what they think about when it comes to cost, but they don't think about, Hey, I am going to have to be paying $2,500 a month for this space. I need to get 25 students immediately. I, sh I cannot be losing money on this space. Uh, that is just one of the most essential things for running any business is you cannot be losing money. And so, uh, you know, we're just going to look at some of the things that do cost money when you are running a school. So if you're going to rent, you um, subtract a lot of the initial down payment costs, right? And I think for most people's first jujitsu school, it makes sense to rent because you are going to learn a lot on the go. And sometimes having a building, unless it's just the perfect fit or you already own that building or something like that, sometimes... Uh, you decide that that building wasn't a good fit after a year or two. And now you're not just in the jujitsu business. You are now in the real estate business because you're having to sell this building. But if you have a two-year lease, you get to the end of it, you move somewhere, uh, you move to where you want. And so I would almost always recommend renting first, renting before you buy. But like I said, it wouldn't be, it's not like that all the time. Uh, so then we look at mats. What mats are you going to buy? Because mats are going to be your biggest expense unless you decide to do something different at your gym. Mats are going to be your biggest expense. Uh, and I think you'll, you'll kind of find for a thousand square feet of mats, like eight to 10 grand is, is usually going to be a, a common price for that. Uh, and I think again, a thousand square feet is a perfect spot to start. Uh, I don't think it's where you should finish, but uh, unless you want to finish at that, unless you are just looking for a certain amount of students, which there is nothing wrong with running your business that way. If you're looking to have 100 students all the time, uh, have what they call velvet rope marketing, meaning if someone new wants to try it, you're like, hey, we're at capacity now. But as soon as somebody quits, you're allowed to come in for a trial. Uh, that's a really great marketing strategy. And uh, you, but you have to be happy about making a specific amount. And um, that will be that will be big when it comes to running your gym. But uh, having a, a certain amount of mat space, not overdoing it. So many people want to have like five thousand square feet of mat to start. It doesn't make sense though because you don't have any you don't have any students. You can always grow these things, but spending just to spend or spending just to make it huge at first. Honestly, so few people. Uh, actually care like when they walk into the gym and they go, oh, there's 2,000 square feet of mats and, you know, and not 3,000. They don't really care about that a lot of the time. Uh, most of the time they care about their experience. If there is so little mat space that they're getting their head stepped on, well, that's probably a bad experience. But if the experience is, hey, this is small, it's tight, everybody's super friendly, that's an awesome experience. It doesn't matter how much mat there is on that with that experience.
uh, then the most important cost is going to be your time. How much of your time do you have to dedicate to running a jujitsu school? It's not easy. I did it with a full-time job while competing uh, uh, full-time. And I, and when I say I'm not even competing full-time, just competing a lot, uh, I wouldn't consider it a full-time competition where you're competing every month or something like that. I was just competing a lot still. And it was super, super hard. Uh, had I have been married in the initial time of starting my gym, I think that would have been really tough. Uh, not anymore now because my wife actually helps me run the gym uh, and actually runs a lot of the gym for me now. But uh, you know, initially then before, before that, when I was doing it all on my own, that would have been so hard to add something else into my life. It was so busy uh, doing personal training, running the school and trying to train and compete. And uh, uh, eventually I got to a point where I burnt out on personal training and uh, I was just doing anything I could to get out of doing personal training. And eventually the school got big enough that I was able to do that. Now, when you're looking at this though, Ideally, I think avoiding the burnout, avoiding the really rough uh, season of like, man, these last, because it was like three years where I wanted to quit personal training, but I just didn't have the money to do it. I wasn't making enough in my school. And uh, that was when I started learning to take marketing seriously, when I was like, I've got to figure out a way to get out of this gym or, or to get out personal training so I can focus on what I want to be focused on, which was my martial arts school, my jujitsu school. So as we're going in, as we are looking at how much time it is going to cost us, uh, one of the best ways to find out is to ask people, you know, uh, and this is a, a, just like a little subplot on this, the whole story that is this podcast is networking is going to be important for any business that you run. What networking is, is having friends, uh, you know, having acquaintances, even, uh, it doesn't mean that I have to be going to dinner with these people every Sunday or something like that. But when I go to a jujitsu tournament, uh, I know hundreds of people at these jujitsu tournaments because I really take marketing seriously. I recognize that it is important to know people in my business and to have good relationships with them because I will see people at jujitsu schools. We'll start talking. Somebody will tell me, yeah, man, I finally figured something out. I'm finally growing my school. And then I'll be like, oh, shoot, tell me about it. But if I didn't have that friendship, I didn't have that relationship where we just feel comfortable talking about this stuff, then I would never know these secrets that I get, right? So going in and, and being cool with everybody, I know that the cool thing in jujitsu is to have every gym that you hate be like, oh yeah, we don't associate with these people or whatever. But if you stop doing that, it makes running a jujitsu school so much easier. Uh, it, it makes it so much easier to learn from other people. And so you can always, if you start to build a good network and you should be, even if you're a white belt listening to this, you should be building a network in your the in the jujitsu community in your area right now. You should be making new friends. You should be like meeting new people in, in trying to talk to them and get their opinions and their thoughts and help them in any way that you can that is convenient, right? Uh, you don't want to run somebody's jujitsu program for them for free or something like that, but you help these people. And, uh, you know, like I, I look at it for the area that I'm in. I have run a school, I, I, I've run a school a lot, lot less long than most of the school owners in our area. And uh, I have no enemies that, you know, no people I see at these, these tournaments where I'm like, oh, I don't like this guy. I don't, I avoid him. I don't talk to him or something like that. And it helps me so much because people are willing to help me out because we've just been friends forever. Right. So you go in, you make sure, you know, we talk about this when it's building your brand on the, uh, how to make money doing jujitsu episode. And I think that's really good to think about is you're always building a brand for your jujitsu school before you ever have a jujitsu school. If you are known in your area for being a douchebag and then you open up a school is when you finally get your brown belt or your black belt or whatever, you're still going to be known as a douchebag that just has a school. And, uh, you know, you're going to give your students a bad reputation, your students a bad name too. So, uh, you know, that is all just to say that running, uh, having, uh, making sure you know how much time 
that you're going to need to invest in a, into a jujitsu school is important. I'll give you what my thought is on it. Um, but again, this is going to be completely for how you want to start your, your or how you want to run your own jujitsu school. Because uh, some people, they go in saying, I want to be there every day. I want to be teaching privates every day. For me, that is not what I want to do. I like to, well, I like to like, really dedicate a lot of mind power, a lot of brain power when I do a private lesson. So for me, I am never do more than like two in a week. And honestly, even a lot of times I do less than that. And so uh, what we'll look at on this is uh, while we're trying, while we're trying to get to the growth part, right. To get to like, I really think, uh, the first goal for most gyms is your break-even amount, which you generally uh, have to put in the most amount of work for. And your break-even amount is going to be, can you pay all your bills with the amount of students that you have? Uh, it's not hard math. You look at what you're charging, you look at what your costs are, and you don't miss costs, meaning don't say, okay, it's $1,500 a month for rent. That's my only cost. No, you have to have your website. You have to have your membership software. You have to have all of those other things already solved. And there are ways to do that really cheap. And there are ways to do that more professional, but more expensive. And so you kind of decide on what you want to do with those things. You look at your overhead costs. You say, okay, it's going to, I need 24 students at this amount of money to break even. You can even open, you can do a grand opening and say, hey, your first 24 students get to come into the gym at $99 a month and they will get that cost forever. No matter how much we raise it by those first 24, as long as they stay, they will get a really good deal on the price, right? And so that can be a way to kind of grow. But honestly, during that time, while you're looking to fill all those seats to pay your bills. I think that is the hardest time for people when it comes to uh, when, when it comes to running a school because you are just putting in every free second of your time. Uh, I would say you're probably going to be spending at the bare minimum. It, it's going to be over 20 hours a week that you're spending on your school. And since we're going in with the mindset that most likely you are. Uh, uh, working a full-time job because your school is losing money at this point, right? Uh, we're looking that you're working too to be able to make ends meet unless you just had a really good amount of money saved or something like that. That's going to be tough. It is going to be tough to uh, to work those 20 hours when you're already working a 40 when you're already working 40 hours. And the amount of brain power that decision making takes is so much higher than uh, if you have a job that doesn't that doesn't require you to make a lot of big decisions, you're making huge decisions when you run any business uh, and you run it yourself. You're making big decisions that greatly affect your life almost on a day to day basis. And so you want to to look at that. You want to 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 decide. Okay, do I have these twenty hours a week to start to really push? And uh, that's again, those twenty hours are no private lessons nothing else like that, just trying to market, trying to learn more and running your gym, running your classes, cleaning your mats, cleaning up your whole gym, you know, doing all those things. Cause generally when you start, you're doing everything. Now, the next phase is going to be from your break even amount to about 60 students, 60, 75 students. That seems to be this no man's land that everyone gets stuck in. And most people just stay there forever while running their jujitsu school. Uh, so how I so what I would say is, and this is not just true with jujitsu schools, but it's true with life. Uh, addiction to moderate success is your enemy. If you are trying to be an entrepreneur, if you're trying to be successful at anything, addiction to moderate success is your enemy. So many of us can push through when things suck. And so many of us can work hard when things suck because we know, you know, we believe in ourselves. When there's a light at the end of the tunnel, we can get there. Now, the problem is a lot of people get to, let's say, 50, 60 students. And that hunger, that thirst, or that grind, it stops because now they're making a, a $1,500, $2,000 a month, $3,000 a month, even if they're charging a good amount, even four, 
they're making four grand a month just teaching jujitsu. Man, that's almost enough to just live off of. That's almost what we need, right? But the problem is if we stay there forever, we're going to have to stay there forever. Everything's going to have to stay the same. I can't move. I can't get a bigger space because we just don't have enough students. I can't get new mats. We don't have enough students. And I'm living off how much I make per month here. Now, once you, like I said, once you start to get out of this, that's when things can really start to grow. But in that break, even that 20 to 60, 75 students, uh, that is the hardest fight in that success that you get that little bit of success. It makes you start to feel comfortable. It's just like when you want to be a world champion at whatever belt, you're a purple belt, you want to be a world champion and you go into the gym and you beat everybody, right? And you get addicted to beating everybody at your gym. Even though sometimes you're sacrificing good training so that you can win. Uh, sometimes you are skipping nights that you're a little tired because, well, if I'm a little tired, somebody's going to beat me at the gym. Or I am, I could be starting in bad positions that I should be working on because at Purple Belt Worlds, these guys are going to get me there. Uh, but I don't want to start in bad positions with the guys at my gym because what if they submit me? That is addiction to moderate success. That is a addiction to uh, um, something you shouldn't have, honestly. Uh, you shouldn't overly focus on. Uh, the moderate success should be a precursor to huge success. Uh, for me, on my podcast, I would consider a lot of the growth that I've had being moderate success. And it would be very easy for me to say, this is what the podcast will be forever. Hooray. But that's not the end goal. That's not the most important thing. I want to be able to put money into this podcast because it's important to me. And you want to do that with your jujitsu school. You want to be able to buy a bigger building. You want to be able to grow it. Um, so in that 20 to 75 student mark, you'll still probably be at 20 hours because what you did to get there uh, will continue to work um, 20 hours plus, like 20 hours bare minimum. But once you start to grow past that, once you start to get past 75, you start to get some higher belts in that want to learn how to teach because that's important. Not like, hey, I want to pawn this off on people. Uh, I want people to learn how to teach because then they can have their own schools or they could teach privates or they can teach seminars or they can make money doing jujitsu some way too. So for me, when I'm looking at that with my students, I have a lot of guys that are like, trying to kill for these spots of, I want to teach this night, or I want to teach this night. And, uh, you know, that's when you stop working as much, uh, in your jujitsu school. But when you stop working as much in your jujitsu school, you really should start working more on your jujitsu school, meaning, uh, to hire the right people to, to be able to grow your jujitsu school where you want it to be, or to be able to, uh, Man, there's so many different things that we could try to do with jujitsu uh, while, while we run a school to build a competition team, right? It's much easier to build a competition team when I'm making money teaching jujitsu. It makes it so much easier to build a competition team. So that is, uh, you know what? That is what we'll leave you guys. I'll just leave you guys um, with some little thoughts then on um, how to get a little more training teaching because we didn't talk about. What if you suck as a teacher and you're building this jujitsu school? So some things you can do first off is learn on the job, learning to just go in and start teaching and critique yourself. Say, hey, are people actually understanding what I'm trying to communicate? Uh, when I teach something now and I walk around the room, very seldom do I feel a need to help a lot of people because uh, I've gotten a lot better at communicating with them gotten a lot better explaining what I'm trying to explain, making it simple enough for people to just be able to say, okay, I can go in and drill this. And uh, I think that's really important to, to learn that learning to teach is such a, a big skill set. And uh, like I said, one of the easiest ways to teach is just to ask to teach at whatever school you're at now. Uh, and a lot of times people are excited when you ask to teach, hey coach, I would love to teach one class every other week or something like that. I'm just trying to get my feet wet in teaching and see if I even like teaching. Uh, I promise you, your coach will, um, 
your coach will, will be excited about that. They will be like, yeah, yeah, we need it. Unless you're not, unless they just feel like you're not ready to, uh, and that happens too, or, uh, there are just a lot of people in front of you that are uh, being allowed to teach and be in getting that experience. And so, uh, that is what I'll leave you with just that little tip on making sure you are being cognizant of if you are a good communicator or not a good teacher or not, and constantly trying to learn how to be a better teacher. If you guys uh, like that idea, I would be happy to do a, uh, a whole episode on being a better teacher and uh, you know how to explain things to people and how to structure classes and how to structure a curriculum entirely. Uh, I, w- I would really, uh, I would enjoy doing that one. So if you guys have any interest in that podcast, uh, be sure to let me know. But if not, that's all I have for you guys. And that is the episode. I just want to thank you guys for listening to the entire episode. Like I said, at the end of it, if you guys want to hear me talk about, uh, uh, building a curriculum and and how to do that. Uh, you know, it's it's funny. I, I forget how many higher belts listen to this show. Uh, I really, when I started the show, I thought, okay, I'm going to tell everything to my white belt self that I wish I knew. And uh, so that was my vision. And I know we have a lot of white belts that listen to the show, but our big majority is actually upper belts. And so things like this, things of like getting set up to run your own jujitsu school, I never realized how important they were to our listeners uh so and the only way i can realize how important that these things are is if you guys tell me and so if you guys want to hear about uh, my thoughts on building a curriculum and uh you know being able to create good competitors or or to be able to learn jujitsu deeper or just kind of every aspect of learning jujitsu i would love to do an episode on that uh, but I would just like to hear from you guys. You can always message me at the Josh McKinney on my Instagram, or you can send me an email, Josh at simplifyingjujitsu.com. And while we're talking about simplifying jujitsu, do not forget for the next two days with promo code Black Friday, you can get 40% off of anything in the entire store, including Josh McKinney's Mastering the Duck Guard that I think you guys will really enjoy. And so uh, that's all I have for you guys today. I hope today's episode was fun. Uh, I hope it gave you a a little bit of a perspective shift. I hope it um, cleared some things up for you on running a jujitsu school. And most importantly, I hope that it helps you suck just a little bit less at jujitsu. You guys have a great rest of your day. Have a happy Thanksgiving. What's up guys, Josh here again. I just wanted to tell you, give you a little more information on some of the other content that I produce that isn't just the I Suck at Jiu Jitsu show. If you are wanting more information on how to become more efficient and effective in your Jiu Jitsu training, the number one thing that I always recommend to people is my Patreon page, the I Suck at Jiu Jitsu show Patreon page because we release a five to 15 minute exclusive episode every single Saturday. This is called Suck Less Saturday, and it is completely focused on being for your jujitsu training, for your jujitsu mindset, and for your jujitsu progression. And so what we'll do is a quick but deep dive on a different thought, idea, or training method every single Saturday. And you can only get this on our Patreon page. I also have a few spots open, depending on what time you're listening to this podcast, for my Suck Less Coaching. What that is, is a monthly cost to get a monthly meeting with me where we meet over Zoom and set some goals based on what you are trying to accomplish in Jiu-Jitsu and set some different training methods uh, to help you get there. Uh, There's nothing like this online right now. There is no Jiu-Jitsu coaching that teaches you how you should be training. uh, And it is exclusively on the ISAC Jiu Jitsu Patreon page. Also, if you guys want to just be in more contact or you want to learn a little more about my ideas in Jiu Jitsu, I highly recommend that you subscribe. 
that you sign up for Simplifying Jiu-Jitsu. It is a free ebook. It is at simplifyingjujitsu.com. And what we do is we break down the top five positions, the essential five positions of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. These are the five positions where most Jiu-Jitsu, 90 plus percent of Jiu-Jitsu takes place in. And we break down how to train them, how long you should be training them, and what order uh, you can train these things to progress faster and easier with your jujitsu. And lastly, if you guys would just give this show a subscribe and a share, it would be very greatly appreciated. Also, you can review us on certain uh, podcast platforms. If you guys want to keep up with me personally, you can follow me at my Instagram at the Josh McKinney. And that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you for listening. I hope that you guys listen to the next one. Thank you.